Sports world, a major court ruling today involving the size of coaching staffs in the country. The environmental outlook continues clear and cool. Plus tonight, part one of our new News 3 Accent Series. Operator, this is an emergency. Those stories and more are coming up next on News 3. on WRCB TV. All the best from Channel 3. WRCB TV 3, Chattanooga. This is News 3, reported by Al Warlick and Jackie Schulten, with Bill Lambden on sports and Neil Kassebaum on the environment. Hello there. We have some major problems to report tonight on the swine flu vaccination program nationwide. Today, three elderly residents in a county in Pennsylvania died of coronary problems after receiving the flu vaccination. Pennsylvania health officials immediately stopped the program there. So did the health departments in four other states. Initially, it, it is possible, they say, that the deaths were merely coincidental. But some health officials tonight are just not sure. We have a report now on the situation here in Hamilton County. The News 3's T.R. Gunn. Word today that some areas of the country were having problems with swine flu vaccines left a lot of people concerned. Those who have already had the shot are now wondering if they'll get sick, and those who were thinking about getting the shot were having some reservations about going ahead. There is no evidence at this point to indicate problems here in Tennessee. The state's health department officials say their contacts with the Center for Disease Control indicate the program can continue. Dr. Frank Failing of the Hamilton County Health Department says we've had no problems here. We've had, uh, I'd say, two or three. Uh, one young girl uh, did go to the emergency room with a temperature of 103. Uh, they gave her some aspirin, suggested she go home. Uh, we've had some employees here that have run a slight fever, 101, 102, but this is, this is not out of the line for any type of vaccine of this, of this nature. And in fact, the, uh, the slips that they gave the people in the instructions on the consent form implied this might happen. So the vaccine program continues for the time being with the hope of many that the problems resulting so far have been nothing more than coincidence. T.R. Gunn, News 3. A $350,000 medical malpractice suit was filed today in Hamilton County Circuit Court. The plaintiffs, Cora and Spears McAllister, alleged that Dr. Charles Sinecht of Chattanooga was negligent in prescribing some exercises for Mrs. McAllister's neck. Dr. Sinecht is a rheumatologist. Mrs. McAllister alleges in the suit that the exercises caused extreme injury to her neck. And about 50 drug and alcohol abuse counselors are taking part in a three-day workshop at the health department in an effort to learn new techniques in counseling. The workshop is being conducted by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and News 3's Raymond Cook has more on that story. There is more to drug detoxification than medically removing the patient's dependency on the drug. Counseling also plays a part in helping the patient make the adjustment. One of the workshop's leaders, Dr. Herbert Cleaver, an associate professor of psychiatry at Yale University, says many heroin addicts have problems when they try to undergo detoxification from methadone. We take patients who are on heroin and put them on methadone basically to try and have a period of time to rehabilitate them. They come in, take their methadone on a regular basis, and we can work with them psychologically, vocationally, educationally. After they've been through that, then of course we're left with the problem, how do you get that individual off methadone? And that's not an easy job. Uh, one of the things that we're talking about at the workshop is how to do that. Dr. Cleaver says when a heroin addict completes detoxification from methadone, his problems with drugs may not be over. Often such people turn to other forms of drug abuse, such as alcoholism. Raymond Cook, News 3. The buses roll and schools finally open in Marion County and Governor Busby of Georgia says our city sticker law is cheap gimmickry. Those stories are next. 
A Shapiro's fruit basket speaks a language all its own. It says, hello, I'm thinking of you. A Shapiro's fruit basket says, I love you. It says, just wanted to say thanks. A Shapiro's fruit basket says, get well soon. It says, well, whatever you want it to say, and it does it beautifully. A Shapiro's fruit basket from 1095. Shapiro's on Cherry Street. Call 266-3669. The last place I want to feel the pressure of my job is under my arms. So I use Sure Antiperspirant every morning. Sure is so effective, it helps keep me dry all day. And sure is different. It even goes on dry, unlike most sprays, which go on wet and oily. Now, when this plane is full, I'm under a lot of pressure. But at least I can take my coat off without worrying about it. Because even on the longest days, Sure helps keep me dry all day. I'm sure. This fall, NBC sends you all the best. Serpico, he's not the only cop in New York. He just thinks he is. Please hold it! That's a good way to get into trouble, and an even better way to get results. Sometimes. This is set up. But there are more cops outside than the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Serpico, the undercover cop who made such a name for himself, they made a movie about him. The man deals only through mules like Alec. There's no way to touch him. I don't know. Why don't we use our imaginations? Serpico, a one-of-a-kind guy in a town with no use for heroes. I don't know who made the call. We're still investigating. Yeah, you're investigating. Can I find out who made the call? The man is out, Frank. He's out. Serpico. You wouldn't want his job. He could lose it any minute. Marion County School Superintendent and the local director of the vocational school are in Nashville. They're meeting with State Education Commissioner Sam Ingram, discussing final plans for a combination vocational high school in Jasper. A three-week boycott of schools in Jasper ended today when some 2,000 students returned to classes. Board and the Marion County Quarterly Court have all agreed they'll spend an additional $400,000 to make the change in the vocational school already under construction in Jasper. This morning, students again attended classes at four schools, which had been closed a week ago because of the parent-student boycott, which began September 21st. At Marion County High School in Jasper, the noise of banging lockers and the smell of pizza from the lunchroom filled hallways which had been emptied when parents decided they wanted a new high school in Jasper. There was some concern if the boycott continued too long, it would cause problems for some hundred seniors who planned to graduate this spring. Not so, according to one senior. It was nice while it lasted, but we're glad to be back, and I think it's helped our county. It's kind of unified them and uh, we've got what we wanted and we're just all glad to be back. How do you feel about the tutoring classes? Did it help you keep up? Yes, ma'am. They've pretty well kept us occupied and so now we'll get a double load and we'll be right in there with everybody else. We so, won't be behind. So now it seems Marion County's school problems are over and they have been stormy for at least three years. People in the county seem to be happy with the plan and the state has already said if the people are happy, so is it. This is homecoming week at Marion County High, and by the time next year's queen is crowned, the school should have a new building and a new football field for that big game of the year. Jackie Schulton, News 3. While some of the major problems in Marion County seem to be coming to a halt, it looks like over in Grundy County there are new problems to report tonight. A group called Concerned Citizens, which is really a local PTA group, is trying to find some money to replace the elementary school there. The school was partially destroyed by fire last May, and now some 140 students in the 5th and 6th grades are crammed into the gymnasium for classes. The school has a total enrollment of 650 children. It's the largest elementary school in Grundy County. The Concerned Citizens group is calling for a boycott, just as they had in Jasper, and they aren't blaming the new school board or quarterly court. They just want to find some money for a new school. The quarterly court says it will be some four or five years before they can afford a bond issue for the new school. The school has other problems, including inadequate sewage systems that occasionally back up into the restroom. Georgia's Governor George Busby has joined the growing list of critics now concerning Chattanooga's $5 city sticker. 
Busby called the requirement for non-residents cheap fundraising gimmickry. The governor also called on Chattanooga City Commissioners to repeal the city sticker law, at least as it applies to out-of-state persons. Busby said Tennessee's Governor Ray Blanton has discussed the matter with him, and he has promised to take up the matter with the Tennessee Attorney General. The ordinance, as you know, requires a $5 sticker for residents and non-residents making more than 30 trips into the city each year. Jack. A statewide effort is underway to train county court clerk personnel in each of Tennessee's 95 counties in handling the new staggered vehicle registration system. Thomas McRedman of Tennessee Department of Motor Vehicles met with the staff of Hamilton County Court Clerk Bill Knowles. The new system will eliminate the long lines at the courthouse at renewal time. Your vehicle will come up for renewal depending upon the first letter of your last name, and the amount of registration fee will also vary the first year. Persons whose last name begin with the letters N-O-P or Q will pay only $12.75. If your last name begins with the letters A or B, you will pay $26.25, but your tag will not have to be renewed until June of 1978. A three-week bus trip across the state for Democrats stopped off at the Hamilton County Courthouse today. Among the Democratic state officials on the bus were House Speaker Ned McCorder and State Treasurer Harlan Matthews. The Democratic caucus campaigners are working for local candidates across the state, and it's estimated they'll travel some 4,000 miles during that trip. Chattanooga was the first stop. The search continues for Trini Gibson, but there's not much hope left, and the Humane Society says it's getting swamped with telephone complaints. Those stories coming up. There are potatoes for boiling and potatoes for mashing, potatoes for bacon and potatoes for hashing, but only one potato is good enough for Wonder Potato Chips, a genuine chipping potato, lighter color, lighter taste. Why, Wonder's even improved the way they crisp them. Every chip's gold and light, the way you like them. Fresh. Tastes terrific. Wonder, the chip and potato chips. And now, free, Wonder Snacks recipe booklet in your store. I made a mistake last fall. I thought the flea season ended when summer ended. It didn't. First Duke got fleas, then my family got fleas. In fact, my home had a case of flea festation. We've got the answer this fall. Sergeant Sentry 4 Collar. Sergeants invented the flea and tick collar, and Century 4 gives long-lasting protection, even kills ticks. This fall, protect your whole family from flea festation with Sergeant's Century 4 collars. This fall, NBC sends you all the best. How about a flicker? You said I could flash on and off, right? <laughs> Sam Casey gets 24 hours a day just like everybody else. But within that, 15 minutes like nobody else. With the priceless power to disappear at will. The catch? You can stay invisible no more than 15 minutes per day. What happens at 60? You fade away and you never come back. It's all in the wrists. And his atomic wristwatch DNA stabilizer. Without that, you fade out permanently. A fantastic gift for think tank super agent Sam Casey, the Gemini Man. Sam has no place he can't hide. Out of sight. Better than bionics. When he's not there, there's bound to be excitement on his incredible missions of global security. Ben Murphy is Gemini Man, co-starring Catherine Crawford. The search for a missing 16-year-old girl from Knoxville is winding down this afternoon in the Clingman's Dome area of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Officials say the chances of finding the girl are now very small. 20 rangers again search the area around the 6,600-foot mountain on the North Carolina-Tennessee border today. Extensive searches since Saturday have failed to turn up a trace of Trini Gibson. Her parents are remaining at park headquarters in Gatlinburg. Jack? Officials from the Chattanooga Hamilton County Educational Humane Society say they are having numerous complaints about dogs running loose and not having the proper tags. News 3's Bob Young reports on why the tags are important and why your pet should have one. If you need a city sticker and a safety lane inspection for your car, a swine flu shot for your health, and for your dog, you need a license. The licenses are for those dog owners who live in the city of Chattanooga, Signal Mountain, or in the county, other than areas that have their own enforcement. The tags were due April 1st, and now officials said they will put on extra people to enforce the laws if they have to. Evidently, some people have been ignoring the license tag regulations. The reason 
We're cracking down on the rabies and lice and laws is simply because there's several hundred people that have failed to uh, get their dogs inoculated and licensed uh, this year. So we'd urge all pet owners to get their rabies shots, mail them to the Humane Society 212 North Highland Park Avenue, or drop by here. We're open seven days a week. And get your dog license. It's $3 for the city, uh, $3 for the town of Signal Mountain, and $1 for Hamilton County. The rabies shots are available at most animal clinics. The dog owner should receive a rabies tag and certificate. He is then ready to go to the Humane Educational Society for a license. Owners who fail to comply could face a $50 fine. The money made from the sale of dog licenses is for the enforcement of rabies control laws in this area, and that's for the protection of the public. Bob Young, News 3. Mrs. Fred Sanders of East Ridge is the owner of a Chihuahua dog that lost all of her puppies but one. Well, about the same time, her son found two squirrels, two baby squirrels, at a construction site. You want to guess what happened? News 3 captured the unusual sight today as the mother Chihuahua nursed the baby squirrels. According to Miss Sanders, the mother was a little upset at first, but she nursed the youngsters four weeks now. The squirrels appear to be about seven weeks old and will most likely become family pets. The surviving pup doesn't seem to mind his strange bedfellows. The young squirrels appear healthy, and the mother Chihuahua is reported doing fine. Can you believe that? Well, Chihuahua puppy probably wondered what happened to its front teeth, you know, <laughs> compared to its other brothers there. Well, if the Chihuahua puppy starts coming in the house with a collection of acorns, she'll know that they happen. <laughs> you think that could happen? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know about Chihuahuas climbing trees. I'm well, not much of a dog how is expert. Your, uh, you recovering? It's there. I'm getting better. Yeah, a lot better. Last it's night, too I bad. Think then you won't uh, be able to take your medicine anymore. <laughs> Some good medicine, I'll tell you. Well, listen, we got a little bit of um, oh, moderation of our temperatures as we thought would happen about this time last week. Now that this week is here, we had a high of 74 with a record of 88 in 1963. 32 was the record in 1906. We only cooled down to 45 this morning, presently 73. Humidity 43, the barometer 30.17 falling. The winds out of the south, southeast at 7, and of course, no rainfall in Chattanooga. The News 3 Air Pollution Index. Today, it is a 6. We are getting up there once again. The outlook for tomorrow is much of the same with another 6. There was no pollen in the air. The News 3 Oxidant Level in the light range, and that was 2 p.m. The nation remained virtually precipitation-free today because of two large high-pressure centers, one in the northeast and one over southwestern Montana. There was some light drizzle in northwestern Oregon, through northern North Dakota, and along the Atlantic coast of the state of Florida. Temperatures were typical for October, ranging from the 40s in the northern New England states to the 90s throughout the desert southwest. Afternoon highs were mostly in the 60s and the 70s. Dry weather has been welcomed by the residents of the Appalachians and the Atlantic coastal area because of heavy rainfalls that soaked that area last week. Frederick, Maryland had rains up to six inches last week and that produced flooding that is now 10 feet deep in some locations of that city. The Broad River, Blair, South Carolina, crested 23 feet above flood stage, and the Congaree, Columbia, South Carolina, is now 11 feet out of its banks, and there also are some reports of major flooding throughout Virginia and West Virginia. The afternoon high was in the desert southwest with 93 degrees at Thermal, California, and the morning afternoon low, I should say, was 48 at Caribou, Maine. Well, 24 hours ago, I said high pressure would be continuing over the southeast, and that's exactly what has happened. It was over Pennsylvania yesterday, now it is over New Hampshire, and we've had a fair and mild day over the entire southeast. It'll be fair and cool tonight, fair and mild tomorrow, as once again, high pressure is going to continue. So we've got nothing but good weather in store for the next 24 to 48 hours in the Chattanooga area. Fair right on through Thursday, the low in the mid-40s, the high in the mid-70s, the winds west, 5 to 10 miles per hour, and for the news, three five-day extended outlook, you've got to look pretty hard for some shower activity, and if you say you see some, <laughs> well, Friday fair, Saturday fair, and Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, we will have partly cloudy skies, and the sunrise tomorrow will be 745. How do you know that? Because there's a little chart on my wall that tells oh. me what time the sun's coming up. Yeah, and that chart's good. You can tell us what it is on Christmas Day, can't you? If, if you'd like, I could run right back there no, and no, tell you. I mean, uh, I, like, I like the surprise of it, though. I thought it was a daily thing. I didn't know it was predicted that far in advance. The yeah. Weather Service has that down pretty fast. That's so true. We can just get the weather straight now. You know, as the news unfolds each day, those of us in this business of television news are always confronted with the problem of trying to give complex stories the amount of time they really deserve. Well, most stations ignore the problem, reasoning that television, being the kind of medium it is, just does not play very well to longer stories. Well, here at News 3, those of us don't subscribe to that theory. 
Tonight, we begin a new series here on News 3. You see it over my shoulder. It's called Accent. It's a chance for our reporters to accent important stories and a chance for our viewers to see in-depth stories that are very important to them. Tonight's accent is called Operator, This is an Emergency. It's an accent look at emergency facilities in this area. Here's News 3's Tom Ditt. Residents of this area are like their counterparts in any other section of the country. They have accidents, whether they be of the traffic or daily household variety. Accidents plague us all. In an average day, several hundred people will call for help after they've had an accident, and a portion of these will enter a hospital emergency room. But the care the victim of an accident receives before arrival at a hospital can sometimes mean the difference between life and death. Most accident victims get to the hospital by way of an ambulance. And just as times change, the ambulance service is changing. Where have we come in the ambulance service within the last several years in this, this area and the health care emergency delivery system? Tom, we've come from a non-professional field into a professional field. In, prior to 1972, uh, the funeral homes operated the service. Uh, since 1972, the funeral homes have gone out of the business. Uh, it's gone primarily to either a county-operated or a municipality-operated service. The uh, private citizens, uh, I think, are benefiting from this type of consolidation of services. We see emergency and the exploits of the paramedics in Los Angeles County. Is this too far in the future, or is it right around the corner? Tom, it's right around the corner. We're starting the advanced EMT program in the Chattanooga area uh, November the 8th. Uh, it will last approximately six and a half to seven months. And this is being held by the Chattanooga State Technical Community College, uh, with training being done in the local area hospitals. It's going to be uh, essentially the same that's seen on emergency. Uh, I think maybe a little bit better in that the ambulance personnel themselves will be doing the uh, pre-hospital care rather than a select group. For this area, the paramedics of Los Angeles, Seattle, and Jacksonville were a dream a few years ago. Now paramedics are on the horizon. But what about the care when the ambulance arrives at the hospital? Tomorrow on part two of Operator, This is an Emergency, inside the double doors at the hospital. Tom Ditt, News 3 Accent. Tomorrow night, part two of our special News 3 Accent series, Operator, This is an Emergency. Coming up next, the court and coaches as News 3 continues. It's going on now at Loveman's, the annual Golden Opportunity Sale. And in the boys' shop, there's a wide assortment of fine clothing that has been greatly reduced. There's a wide assortment of quality leather-looking PVC jackets in many different styles for $12.99 and $18.99. Long-sleeve knit shirts in a variety of solids and patterns are reduced to $2.99 and $3.99. Perfect for school are these corduroy jeans that have been marked down to $5.49 and $6.99. Save now in the boys' shop during the great annual Golden Opportunity Sale at Loveman's. Oklahoma seems to have too many coaches, right, Bill? They've got a mess of them, <laughs> and uh, apparently they may get to keep them, too. Yeah, it's because of the NCAA rule that limits football coaching staff sizes. It's in the news again, or perhaps we should say it is in the news still. Oklahoma State Supreme Court today refused to force the University of Oklahoma to reduce their coaching staff size. Under the existing NC2A rule, the Sooners would have been forced to ax two of their ten assistants. But a lower court issued an injunction forbidding the NCAA to enforce that rule, and the Oklahoma State Supreme Court upheld the whole order. A ruling on the legality of the NCAA limit will follow sometime in the near future. Tennessee fans may want to pull up a chair now. We're going to look at the highlights of Saturday's pasting of Georgia Tech. With Alabama and Florida coming up in consecutive weeks, Vol rooters may want to do their smiling now. Let's take a look at the highlights. At Grand Field on the Georgia Tech campus Saturday afternoon, Frank Fox drew first blood with this score from the three. Randy Wallace hits Stanley Morgan next, and the Vols move on top 14-0. Morgan has caught 10 passes this season for Tennessee, averaging slightly better than 20 yards a catch. The Big Orange pushed their advantage to 21 when Stanley Morgan powered in from the two. This capped an 82-yard drive for visiting Tennessee. Another short dive by Kelsey Finch pushed the lead to 
and the balls were rolling. Finch has gained 287 yards this year, averaging 4.9 a try. Frank Fox set up another touchdown with his 77-yard scamper. Then McMinn County, Hubert Simpson right there, capped the ball volcano with this score. But this Saturday, the Bear brings his team to Knoxville. Alabama's been twice beaten, but they're still strong. Despite those two defeats, Tennessee's Bill Battle is publicly praising his old alma mater. One of the most sophisticated schemes that I've ever seen. They do more blocking schemes, pulling guards, misdirection options, regular options, and then when they just come at you, they're awesome. They haven't uh, moved the ball as well as they have in the last couple of years, but they have had more errors. The thing that has beaten them, I think, is turning the ball over uh, more times than they did last year. But they have the, some, many of the same players that have played for them for the last year or two. Great backs like Johnny Davis and Calvin Culliver and uh, Rutledge and O'Rear are the quarterbacks that run the show. And Ozzie Newsom, of course, is a fine split in and they have a great offensive line. The rest of the Atlanta Falcons coaching shuffle was made today. Yesterday, head coach Marion Campbell was axed, and today, defensive coordinator Fred Bruni, defensive line coach Fred Kayad, and offensive coordinator Bill Nelson were given the heave-ho. The Browns, the Browns meet the Falcons in Atlanta on Sunday. Tonight, I'm pleased to announce that a touch of sanity has come into the Associated Press High School football poll. Finally, after demolishing most of their opponents this year, undefeated Kirkman has joined City and Bradley County in the AAA poll. Kirkman is in the anchor slot, but I'm sure that feels better than being unranked. Oak Ridge continues on top. Sadly, after Thursday night, chances are either Kirkman or City will drop backs off the rankings. Their showdown will probably see to that. Milan continues on top of the AA rankings. Cleveland is 10th. Their loss came to AAA school Red Bank. And in single A, not much change. Rockwood stays on top. Sweetwater is seventh, South Pittsburgh tenth. And congratulations tonight to George Keith, star running back for Notre Dame. He gained 252 yards in 48 carries in his game last Friday night during that Irish overtime loss to Tyner. Now, I don't want this sportscast to go by without mentioning the now public dismissal of Lookout's general manager, Jerry Lambert. Personnel changes are a part of the game. Unfortunately, in this case, the usual amenities weren't followed. I'm sure it's a situation neither Jerry Lambert, the Reeds, or the parent A's organization enjoyed. Despite the two-point difference, it really wasn't much of a heart pounder out at McClellan Gymnasium last night. That's not to say the fans were shortchanged, though. Instead, they saw a Washington Bullets team that seemed to take it easy for three quarters and then turn it on in the final stanza. That effort was almost enough to catch Bud Saradine's Atlanta Hawks, almost, but not quite enough. John Drew was high point man for the Hawks. He continues to impress. When Drew's on the floor, everyone else looks just a little clumsy. Rookie Armin Hill also showed good promise for the Bullets playing minus Wes Unseld and Jimmy Jones, Elvin Hayes and Nick Weatherspoon stood out. Ron Shoemate was his usual optimistic self this morning for the kickoff drive of UTC's basketball season ticket sale. However, he tempered that with warnings that people shouldn't start becoming complacent. The mock ticket sale begins on November 1st. And I am looking forward to the Kirkman City game. It's the high school game of the year. It's it should be. should be. Have you had your swine flu shot yet? No, I don't think I'm going to get one. <laughs> well, you really should. <laughs> uh, even, though, even though the vaccination program is running into trouble nationwide, there seems to be no trouble here locally, as the local health officials report. People who have had the vaccination shot have developed no serious side effects. Schools reopened today in Jasper, Guild, and Whiteside following a new high school compromise plan. But Tracy City is now having school problems. The elementary school needs to be replaced, but parents say they will not boycott schools as they did in Jasper. And in the environment, Al, it looks like we're going to have some more gorgeous weather. I heard some great stuff today about fall color cruise. You better believe I think the days. leaves will be perfect yeah, by then. My, oh, boy. Well, this will be my first one. I'm looking forward to it. So the news, weather, and sports this Tuesday night. The NBC Nightly News is next. We'll return at 8 and 11 for our updates. Until then, this is Al Warlick saying, have a nice evening.
up to the gasoline pump. Don't blame the filling station operator because he's having to pay just that much for it himself almost. Blame the multinational oil companies and blame their pal in the United States Senate, William E. Brock III, for it because he's one of the few United States senators that voted against putting price controls on gasoline. Jim Sasser thinks it's time Washington heard you. Music Hall America, a new kind of music show produced on location in Opryland. The top stars of contemporary music are yours to enjoy each Saturday at 6 on Channel 3. WRCB TV, Chattanooga. This is NBC Nightly News, Tuesday, October 12th, with John Chancellor and David Brinkley reporting from the NBC News Center in New York. Good evening. Three older people died in Pittsburgh after they had had swine flu shots. Autopsies on two of them showed there was no connection between the flu shots and their deaths, and all three had histories of heart ailments. But nevertheless, as a precaution, the flu shot program was temporarily suspended in several places today, including at least six states, for an investigation. John? In several other states, officials ordered the vaccine withheld until the situation is clarified. Eric Burns of our staff has more on what happened in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, where the story began, and on the federal government's reaction. Several thousand older people in Allegheny County received swine flu shots in the past week. Three of them, who got their shots at this clinic yesterday, died a few hours later. As a result, all 13 swine flu inoculation sites in Allegheny County have been shut down. At this place, a nurse...